Well, I, when I went from college, I, I became Buddhist when I was 16, and um, then when I went to college, I was involved in a Buddhist group and a socialist political group, and so trying to fit together my social and uh, political interests with my religious and spiritual interests was a part of my problematique at the, at the time, still is. And um, the first effort to reconcile that I, was to go to Sri Lanka and work for a Buddhist development organization, <clears throat> which I did for two years uh, during the Sri Lankan Civil War, which went on for a very long time after that. And uh, while I was in Sri Lanka, I ordained as a Buddhist monk. I think the roots of my interest in transhumanism go back to my childhood when uh, my father was an insurance executive and was very interested in futurism and, and risk uh, assessment, risk management. And he got a subscription for me to um, the Futurist magazine in 1972 or 3, I think. Uh, and so we, I had that in my background and I was also reading a lot of science fiction. It was when, as soon as I learned to read, I just couldn't be separated from science fiction. So uh, that really shaped my childhood, and um, when I got interested in Buddhism uh, and, and uh, left politics, uh, I think that some of the same reasons that I was interested in those things also led me to get interested in transhumanism, and that I'm, I'm interested in radical possibilities for change in the human condition, and um, I think one of the reasons why Buddhism is uh, uh, disproportionately attractive for those transhumanists who have any interest in things spiritual is that it, it's, a, it's a, a philosophical or a practice tradition oriented towards uh, self-transformation. And, uh, and so that's very kind of deeply transhumanist in that respect. But um, the way that I got involved in the transhumanist movement was that when I got back from Sri Lanka and Japan, I went to Japan after Sri Lanka and uh, went to graduate school at the University of Chicago, I was editing, uh, I had started a magazine called the Eco-Socialist Review, which was about the relationship between green politics and, and um, social justice, and then uh, also started studying academically bioethics, which had emerged out of my interest in Buddhism because I was looking for a field where the qu philosophical questions around personhood were um, had a political ramification, and bioethics was one of those areas. And that's that set of interests was uh, eventually what led to my writing Citizen Cyborg, which the central question in Citizen Cyborg is how should we instantiate our new understanding of what um, a person is and what a citizen is in the context of all these different emerging technologies. Um, and so I, uh, in those two spheres, my academic sphere I was doing bioethics and in my political sphere I was doing green politics. And in both of them I realized pretty quickly that I was out of step with the kind of uh, creeping Luddite influence. You no, know, not so creeping in the part of green politics. But, uh, but in bioethics the joke was you only needed to know one word to be a bioethicist, bioethicist and that was no, because every technology you're going to say no to. Um, and I didn't believe that. And, um, and so when I ran across then in the early 90s, the extropians online, I, and some of their early writings about transhumanism, um, I was very taken with it. And um, got online and started talking to the extropians and almost immediately got flamed off by the extropians because it turned out that they were not terribly tolerant of my uh, political uh, views at the time. I think they've become more tolerant over the, over the years. But um, so then I realized, well, okay, there's this uh, techno libertarian thing that's happening out in California around the extropians. Um, but even they acknowledge that that's just one of the many possible flavors of transhumanism. So what I b started to do in the 90s was to figure out, well, am I, uh, what flavor of transhumanist am I, or what flavor of progressive am I? Because I, when you look back in progressive history, you see that there have been lots of uh, people on the left who have had similarly techno-utopian ideas, but that after World War II, that tradition really got, uh, became a very small minority tradition. Um, and so I started eventually the radio show Change Surfer Radio, and Change Surfer Radio was an, an effort to uh, reconnect with that techno-utopian tradition and the folks who, uh, who were relevant to it. And so the byline for Change Surfer Radio was uh, a sexy high-tech vision of a radically democratic future. And I've talked to hundreds of people who, uh, who connect to that in one way or another. And then uh, I think it was in 19, uh, 1999 
when an essay that I'd written about um, how cryonics would contribute to the debate over the meaning of death, because I was a member of the International De Network for the Definition of Death, and I'd gone, uh, given a paper in Havana, where they meet every four years, um, on how cryonics uh, and the, the status of the, of the frozen uh, would contribute to this growing debate over the nature of death. And Alcor invited me to give that paper at an Alcor meeting, and then I met all the transhumanist players. And I began to discover uh, the World Transhumanist Association, which had a different political um, uh, constitution than the, extra, the extropians. The World Transhumanist Association was much broader politically and more European in its focus. And I felt much more comfortable in that context. So um, eventually I became the executive director of the World Transhumanist Association, which then became the Humanity Plus. And uh, out of the World Transhumanist Association, we decided that we needed to start a think tank, and the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies then grew out of that. <coughs> and the IET has developed its own political and, and independent um, identity since then, uh, which we call a techno-progressive identity, um, which is broad, but it's, it's the left of center someplace. Um, and so uh, a lot of the folks who were spoke at this conference were I, our IET fellows or IET contributors or one way or another. Um, and today we had a, a tag team of Ramez Nam and, uh, and Jamey Cassio saying almost exactly the same things, critiquing the kind of futurism that the IET has been, you know, where we've been trying to add some leaven to this, this whole picture. Well, it was kind of interesting that at this conference, Kim Stanley Robinson and I played out the debate I have in, inside my own head. I was articulating one particular side of that debate here, which is that I think in some ways the term utopianism has become so loaded and uh, it, the, our, its association with static visions of, you know, if I could only freeze myself and wake up in the perfect society, what would that look like? And, that's, and that turns out to be not terribly interesting as a narrative and not terribly interesting as a political project. Um, and so what we, I argued at this conference is that we need a post-utopian set of narratives that are gritty and complex and show the good and the bad. And a lot of people have, have repeated that kind of a message here. Um, and then Kim Robinson said back to me and us what I also say to myself sometimes, which is that, well, yes, but the critique of utopianism is a neoconservative crit critique. It's a, an attempt to dismiss um, and to belittle people's um, efforts to imagine a better world. And we precisely need a rebirth of utopian imagination and utopian energies. And the original title of my talk had, in fact, been Reawakening the Utopian Energy. So, I, you know, when I wrote the abstract, I was on the other side of the bed. Then I, when I got here, I, came, I ended up being more critical. But um, so I, I'm on both sides of that fence. There, there, there are some wonderful critiques of um, uh, the contemporary anti-utopian movement that have influenced my thought. And I think one of the problems with uh, contemporary utopianism such as it is, is its thinness. Like, you know, an example I would give, and I don't want to start a fight, another fight with Robin, but Robin Hansen is a prominent transhumanist economist, although he doesn't call himself a transhumanist anymore. But uh, he, he wrote a very influential paper about uh, what the potential implications of uploading the human brain would be for the economy. And the paper kind of, and he wrote this 20 years ago, and, he, and it kind of blithely um, concludes that the, that the upshot of that would be the proliferation of virtual people in virtual spaces and the mass starvation and death of organic human beings. And that this would just be a natural thing that would happen. And then, you know, there's no way around it. And, and I think that, you know, and some people considered that a utopian vision. I mean, people consider that as a, a, one of the possible great singularities, you know, that there's going to be all these virtual people, but the organic people, well, forget about them. And I, I think that's the problem with a lot of the thinner utopias today is that, um, they, because they can't possibly imagine their way around gender or their way around capitalism or their way around some of the existing institutions of our society, um, they, uh, you know, they don't go to the places where utopias used to go. You know, the Foyer is one of my favorite examples, you know, his notion that we should have a faucet for champagne. You know, why do we just have faucets for hot and cold water? We should have a faucet for champagne. Everyone should have champagne. Um, 
And, you know, why can't we imagine things like that anymore? Uh, so, you know, uh, one of the things that I have pressed and that I think is especially uh, missing and glaring in I, the, the talk in the Borderlands bookstore was about this is the, the how people in this utopian community who expect uh, artificial intelligence and robotics to so radically transform society that nothing will be the same still can't wrap their mind around the notion that we're that the, there won't be a functioning economy after that and that we need to figure out how pe how organic human beings get fed in that world and this is the problem that that Robin was pointing to and then just kind of blithely submit uh, dismissing and that's because they can't see their way to arguing for an expansion of the welfare state you know, the, the, the existing debate that we're having today is how much austerity should we have and, or how much how should we tax the wealthy in order to maintain existing social uh, protections. We're having that debate today. If we don't figure out that debate in the next six weeks, our economy is going to collapse. <laughs> um, so, you know, to, to blithely say, oh, well, you know, people may starve and not recognize that we, we're, we're setting the preconditions for whether that happens today. Um, that's the reason that they can't talk about it because they're not really thinking in the present tense. Well, I think this is, uh, I've used the term a, a couple times here of exoteric and esoteric doctrine, and, which is an old occult idea that, you know, there are certain certain secrets which are you, you keep for the initiates and the, the uh, elect uh, and other things that you talk about with the hoi polloi. Um, but I think there is some truth in that, uh, con in that notion. We've talked here about the notion that, you know, it's fine if you want to talk with other um, initiates about uh, your expectations of immortality or, you know, sharing a beer at the heat death of the universe or something like that. But most people that we're, we want to talk to in the real world to convince them to put some extra National Institutes of Health money into anti-aging research, you know, talking to them about immortality is not going to do the trick. It's just going to scare them off. What you want to talk to them about is that they, you want an extra 10 years to play with your grandkids and, and things like that. So. The, it's the same problem around utopianism is that there is such a – we have to acknowledge that there's a, a, a pre prevalent anti-ideological, anti-utopian um, feeling on the part of many people in the world. And for, for some of them, you can't possibly blame them. I mean, like ch young Chinese, I can't imagine – uh, living in China and then someone coming and saying, I've got a new ideology to sell you, a new utopian vision. Won't it be great? And they're like, and I just want to make some money, you know, Let's forget that. Um, I understand that. Um, and I understand why a lot of other people are skeptical. Um, so for them, you have to couch it around the things that they can relate to. So life extension is one clear selling point. Um, the right to control their own affairs. You know, the, there is, my utopia is not a, an authoritarian utopia. Mine's a liberal utopia. And that's, I think, part of the problem with people's critique of utopianism is that they imagine that utopianism equals totalitarian, uh, uh, authoritarian utopianism. Liberal democracy is a utopian vision. You know, having a, a truly functioning liberal, liber, libertarian society is a utopian vision. So talking to people about what does it, and, and and because I'm a social democrat, the reason I say libertarian is that you can have a vision of a society in which individuals are encouraged and given the resources to control their own personal affairs, but live in a society in which we also uh, have solidarity and public education and public welfare. The two are, in fact, uh, complementary. They're not uh, mutually exclusive. So... Um, that's the my, that's my kind of utopian vision. But clearly, it's easier to talk to people about. Well, don't you want to smoke pot? Um, and don't you want to um, you know be able to uh, go to college? Um, a, a rather than saying, don't you want to live in a society where we uh, have taxed the rich to the point where everyone's equal? And you know the the, the more macro kinds of issues are those are harder to talk about. Well, visions, I remember giving a speech at a labor rally back in 1982, and um, I quoted that rally uh, from the Old Testament, which I have not studied extensively, but there is a, a psalm in which uh, the psalm reads, uh, without a vision, the people perish. And I think the sociological message of that, the, the point of that is, which goes back to Durkheim and people like that before that, is that um, it's very difficult in a post-ideological society or a post-normatively integrated society um, to g inspire the same kind of collective solidarity 
that is necessary to create truly great works, you know, uh, great progress and civilization. So you look at the European welfare states, for instance, um, and uh, in Sweden or Norway. And one of the reasons that they were able to create those is that they were drawing on a deep sense of ethnic solidarity. Um, and they and they were had this vision of them of their country as a as a family with you know and the the ideology was that we we're going to take care of each other. You're going to pay a high level of taxes, but you know that the the da the Dane down the street is going to benefit just as much as your kids from this, and it's not going to be some strange foreign other person who's going to benefit. So you know because of the diversity and cosmopolitanism of the United States and and grow increasingly of the world, it's very difficult to create that sense of shared common purpose anymore. And, you know, we had some of that during uh, the 1960s that helped create the space program because we had the Cold War. And so there was this notion that the United States was in a competition with the, the dirty commies and we needed to get to the moon first. And so people were willing to make certain sacrifices and support certain kinds of programs that didn't seem to have any real, you know, tangible payoff for anybody except to, uh, to this kind of version of sports in space. Um, and where are those projects today? I mean, we, you know, defeating the Taliban isn't nearly the same kind of a project. Um, I think I've argued in the past, uh, although it's not at the top of my agenda, for the colonization of Mars as one kind of project. But again, as with all the space program, it's hard to argue that the colonization of Mars will have any direct tangible benefits for people on Earth. So, you know, how many billions or trillions should we be diverting from, you know, building dams and, and, uh, and wells in Africa to um, sending a colony to, to Mars? The anti-aging research, I think, has, is, is the clearest of all the projects. And, and that's the one that I've argued for, anti-aging research. Uh, and the longevity dividend to be able to convince publics and policymakers and stakeholders that if we can forestall uh, uh, the the disabilities and diseases of aging for 10, 20 years, that we can get past this hump where fertility is declining and uh, the social welfare state is going to be threatened by growing populations of seniors, forestall that for some period of time. We, it, eventually, we're going to have to have all these cataclysmic social changes. But um, we're, if we don't forestall that, you know, we're going to have serious economic problems in the next couple of decades. So I think that there is a strong argument for that from, a pol from an economic point of view, social, and, and from a personal point of view. We all want to live longer. Well, there's dogmas and then there's identity. Let me talk about identity for a second, which is one of the reasons why um, this question of a transhuman identity or cyborg identity became so um, deeply meaningful to me, was that when I went to Sri Lanka uh, back in 1983, uh, I was... I, you know, I was an international socialist, basically. I thought, you know, I, that I was going to be in solidarity with the, with the South against the terrible North and blah, blah, blah. Romantic ideas. And immediately found myself in the midst of race riots being led by Buddhist monks, pogroms against Tamils, where the only way they could tell who was who was by forcing the Tamils to speak so they could hear their Tamil accent and then they could beat them to death. And... I began to become deeply disillusioned with the compromises that the left has made with identity politics over the last, you know, 50 years. Um, and which are things like saying, well, there's progressive nationalism. We can support, you know, this, na you know, Irish nationalism today because it's against imperialism, blah, blah, blah. No, <laughs> there's no progressive nationalism. We're, you're either an internationalist or you think that you have more in common with some tribe of people that, you know, I don't know what connections you have with them. At least with, Dan with Danes, I can understand it. I mean, Danes appear to be actually be, you know, genetically and psychologically different from the rest of Europe. So I can understand having some, but an American nationalist, why? Why be an American nationalist? We are a polyglot civilization. And really, ethically, there's no reason to be a nationalist anywhere. Anyway, so same with religion, same with race, that we had, what we have to do is find a new subjectivity that would replace the old failed notion of an international workers identity because that's obviously is not doing it for people um, and and so what I was arguing was that uh, 
at least at a at a moral level, we can argue that there should be, that we should focus on certain characteristics of sentience and consciousness as the basis of moral um, standings, and that that has certain implications for what kind of rights we give to animals and to fetuses and to the brain dead and to cyborgs and robots and things like that, and that that identity itself, once it becomes a political project, could also be the basis for an international kind of keeping us, holding us all together. And that idea is also suggested in uh, in Bruce Sterling's Schismatrix, where he uses the term transhumanism for an, the ideology that the radically different post-human clades that have uh, evolved should all still work together as a polity, and he calls that transhumanism. Um, so that, uh, I don't know if I lost, oh, because oh, so, so the, uh, the race and religion. So another thing to say about that is I, uh, that having been said, that I think that we need to evolve past those tribal identities. I think that um, there are still meaningful differences between people in terms of their spiritual orientations. And, and race, I don't think it's terribly meaningful. I mean, I think the American Anthropology Association has said that there is no such thing as race. And we're all, now that we're getting our genomes decoded, we're all finding that we're, you know, all 15% this and 12% that. And uh, there may be uh, some slight medical uh, significance to having one kind of genome versus another, but um, and in the future we'll be able to easily change our skin, skin pigmentation and our hair color, and so all, all the characteristics of race should quit very soon become irrelevant. Religion, however, I think will continue to be a divide because I don't think I, I think that the the impulses that lead people to be religious are very deeply uh, you know deep in our psychology. And, um, and some people may root them out with future neurotechnologies, but that may be its own version of religion, and other people will, will satisfy them and feed them with neurotechnologies. Well, Citizen Cyborg uh, started as a political, as a, as a book project or writing project um, when I was in graduate school 20 years ago now. And, uh, it was an attempt to kind of reclaim that, um, at first, it was an attempt to reclaim that connection with the older Enlightenment tradition of techno-optimistic uh, radicalism. And by the time it got written in 2004, the uh, first part of the book was a summary of the transhumanist case for um, imminent radical change in the human condition and an attempt to uh, add some kind of sociological context to it. And this is, one, again, one of the missions of the IAT is to say we can't get there just through techno fixes. Um, and also that there's a continuity between uh, uh, certain social changes and, th and changes that occur through technology. So, for instance, around in in intelligence, the uh, Flynn effect demonstrates that all kinds of social and sociological changes that have occurred over the last century smaller families and better nutrition and so forth have um, increased certain cognitive capacities at a population level um, to the point where we may now be for some populations peaking out not for a lot for you know there are lots of people in the developing world where that's not true where there are lots of social changes that could be done to improve their intelligence and then there might be cognitive enhancement drugs and, and therapies that we could introduce but that there's no reason to say oh, well, let's just hope for this pill when we know that there are all these social things that have worked, will work, should work, should be complementary to. So the, that's a, a key element of the techno-progressive argument, which is that um, the perspective should always integrate the um, social changes uh, that are necessary to ensure the uh, universal benefits from technological change. Um, so it's not just enough to talk about, you know, well, the fact that there might be cognitive enhancement drugs in, in 10 years. You have to talk about, well, how are we going to ensure that everybody has access to them? You know, the, the example of antiretroviral drugs demonstrated that you can have 
uh, you know, things which are functional like cures for diseases and that they, they're too expensive to get into the hands of most people in the world because dr drug companies require certain kinds of profits. And it took an international political campaign and the creation of in international NGOs in order to universalize access to those drugs. And again, that's one of the things that techno futurists often ignore about what's necessary for people to have access to progress. So that was the first part of the book about um, cognitive enhancement, life extension, um, the decline in disability, and so forth. And then I um, spent a lot of time in that book parsing the different flavors of biopolitical thought that were extant at the time, and still, but it's become a far less salient uh, since the economic crisis of 2008. But between 2002 and 2008, basically, there had been a real um, polarization in the United States and, and to some extent around the world around um, Christian bioconservatives, green bioconservatives, uh, some leftist critics of biotechnology finding their common alliances, and then uh, the libertarian and techno-progressive uh, forces trying to figure out what we were going to do with each other. Um, and so I was kind of sketching out this new biopolitical axis that I saw emerging um, and how I think it would shape the future. I think that that's happening much slower than I expected because the economic crisis showed that economics are still a lot more salient than biopolitics for most people. And then the final part of the book was um, to outline what I considered some of the key elements that need to be included in a uh, what I would now call a techno-progressive uh, political platform or political project, <clears throat> the need for international regulation of certain catastrophically risky technologies, um, the need for a basic income guarantee, the need for us to have some minimum agreement about what kinds of psychological characteristics are desirable um, in a future humanity. If, you know, if, all the, if all of our psychological characteristics are thrown open to question and people just start willy-nilly saying, well, I'm going to get rid of my empathy because who cares about empathy? And you know, is that okay with everybody that we just have people get rid of their empathy? So those are the kinds of questions that I addressed in Citizen Cyborg. And it was, in fact, that latter question and, and some related topics that led to my next book project, which was Citizen uh, Cyborg Buddha, which is about the effects of neurotechnology on uh, human virtue and uh, uh, spiritual experience and religion and our sense of self. Well, Cyborg Buddha is... Um, the broadest topic is now called in the field, it wasn't when I started the book, but it's now called moral enhancement. But I, I came to it for a number of reasons. One reason is that I had been teaching a course about the uh, politics of happiness at Trinity. And what I began to realize that the, was that the naive uh, John Stuart Millsian utilitarianism that I had um, for many, for decades, uh, considered, um, you know, kind of ha my my starting point, my philosophical and ethical starting point. People uh, will be happiest if they control their own affairs, and society in general controls its own affairs. And um, the greatest happiness for the greatest number is the goal. You know, that was my starting point. And uh, as I began to teach about the politics, the emerging politics of happiness, which a lot of folks are interested in now. Uh, I began to realize how uh, problematic that kind of a proposition was. And it's not at all clear that people uh, are happier when they control their own affairs, and it's not at all clear that uh, we know what happiness is, and it's not at all clear that we would have any idea what the greatest happiness for the greatest number would, should, could or should mean. And it's not clear whether the greatest happiness should be our goal, ethically. Um, and for as a transhumanist, it, it, one of the biggest problems is that if you believe that eventually we're all going to be walking around with wires or nanotubes or something inside our head that could give us any experience with, that we want, then how could you possibly have as a public policy consequence that you want everybody to be happy because it doesn't tell you at all. It just tells you what button to push in their head. It doesn't tell you what kind of social arrangement to have at all. So um, you really have to transcend that particular kind of utilitarianism. And what I've come closer to is a, a consequentialism that looks towards people having certain kinds of capabilities, which Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum have been arguing for. And uh, and that has a strong Aristotelian element in it, that notion that 
um, that instead of people just being happy, that you want people to have a, t a tangible and validated sense of accomplishment, and that you know that they have to have life projects. Um, so you know we could make every. This is one of the arguments I have with David Pierce. He wants to jack everybody's happiness set point up and have them be motivated by radi gradients of bliss. Well, okay, but don't you care what they are getting the reward of a little bit more bliss from? I mean, it, it, as long as people are still motivated, and there's a question there whether they really be, would be motivated. You know, it's like saying, is the motivation between uh, getting an extra ten thousand dollars when you're already a billionaire sufficient to change your behavior at all? And I don't think it probably is. You know, the the motivation of an extra ten thousand dollars works well when you're at you know less than a hundred thousand dollars income, but not at when you're at a billion. So. People may, in fact, be quite happy just sitting around if they've got enough bliss already, um, and that, so that's one of the problems with this thing. So, and then is uh, if they are motivated, don't you care what they're motivated by? I mean, isn't there a, a sense of judgment that we should have about what projects people set for themselves? And <clears throat> I think there's always been an implicit understanding in the transhumanist community is that humanity has great works to do. You know, that we, we should be getting out there and colonizing the universe and everything. And one of the anxieties that we share inside the transhumanist community is that the Fermi paradox may be precisely because every alien species figures out how to jack its own uh, endorphins and then it just sits around as a lump, you know, like a heroin addict. Um, and we, I don't think we want to end up that way. Okay, so that's that's one of the questions. If we if we're going to be a future society controlled with control of our own neurotech uh, neuro neurology through neurotechnology, um, what are we going to do with that in terms of happiness? Well, okay, so then if we decide that we want to have certain capabilities and we want to use neurotechnology to enhance those capabilities and we want to have certain kinds of life projects, that takes us a lot closer to the notion of human virtues. That there are certain things that we want to cultivate in, as character. And, and certain kinds of projects which help us cultivate those. So patience, compassion, um, uh, you know, persistence, transcendence, these kinds of things. And there's a whole uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, discussion about virtue that draws partly on religious uh, and philosophical texts, but also on the, the emerging social neuroscience research about self-control and the, the neuroscience of empathy and compassion, mirror neurons and oxytocin, and uh, you know, the experience uh, that people have in different kinds of mystical and ecstatic states and, uh, and prayer and meditation. Um, and so I, I've got in the book a model of six core virtues that I propose are virtues that should be enhanced, self-control and, and uh, compassion and things like that. And, um, and then I, I talk about the, uh, the social neuroscience that's emerged around those and what kinds of technologies and uh, pharmaceuticals already are being used or, or could hypothetically be used to enhance those. And uh, you know, there's, you know, every day something's happening that kind of validates this perspective. There's recently a woman who've been very critical of children uh, being prescribed stimulant medications for ADHD, uh, Ilya Singh, and then she started to actually talk to the kids. You know, she like a lot of people, they don't know any kids who take these drugs, and they just say, oh, you know, you're just drugging kids. So she actually went and talked to the kids, and they said, you know what, I used to get in trouble all the time. I used to hit my sister over the head with a brick, and I never knew why. And then I took this drug, and I don't do that anymore, and I feel great. You know, and she said, actually, these kids, this is a moral enhancement for these kids. It they, they gives them the capacity to control their behavior so they don't hurt other people, right? Um, and that was my experience, because I took, AD, I took uh, stimulants as a kid for ADHD. So, um, you know, I think that that's, that's a very important element of the conversation that hasn't really come out. People have this Luddite reaction to certain psychopharmaceuticals, and they don't look at the moral dimension of it. Now, the final part of the book is about um, the implications for these drugs on religion, and I'm basically going to say that every religion will find a use for one psychopharmaceutical or another. I mean, I think the Catholic Church would have done well to um, take a lot of um, uh, horm hormone uh, suppressants for their priests, you know, <laughs> instead of having them all diddling little boys. Um, and then finally, the implications for the self, because neurotechnologies that suppress memory or enhance memory or uh, allow us to share our memories with other people um, that uh, change fundamental aspects of ourselves like our desires, uh, sexual desires or our desires for food or whatever. Um, 
are going to be profoundly disconcerting. And as a Buddhist, you know, one of the core ideas of Buddhism is that we don't, in fact, have continuous, discrete uh, selves, that that's an illusion, and that part of self-liberation is to recognize that that's an illusion, to recognize that you don't really exist, that, that the self is a fiction. And so one of my arguments for years has been that neurotechnology, between neurotechnology and life extension, because you know, the longer we live, the harder it is to maintain the illusion that, that you're the same person that you were you know, a thousand years ago or whatever. Um, and then you combine that with neurotechnology, and you're not only not the same, you know, you're, you know, you have wings and green skin and you're living on Mars in a, in a box, uh, so you're not at all the same kind of person that you were a thousand years ago, but oh, not only that, but you're sharing the memories of 12,000 other people, and, you know, you, they have your memories, and you've suppressed certain memories and, and things like that. So. I think all these technologies will basically um, push us towards what I call the, the post-personal -pers identity era. And I, we don't really know what a post-personal identity social order would look like because all of our existing social order is, is founded on the, the illusion of the continuity and persistence of the self. You know, we, we go so far as to say, when I am gorked out and completely unconscious and on death's door, I know that I will want not to be kept alive on a breathing tube. It's like, what? You know, and no, no one knows what they were going to, you know, people who, you know, you ask if, if you were in a car accident and had burns over 90% of your body and were quadriplegic, would you want to be kept alive? No, absolutely not. You know, most people will say, well, most people who are brought in and quadriplegic and burned all over their body actually want to live. So we're not that good at predicting anything about, you know, what our future selves want. And so uh, that's just, uh, that's a contemporary example. And it's just going to get harder and harder um, in the future. So I think uh, there are a couple science fiction authors who have speculated, John Wright and others have speculated about what kind of a social order might be able to accommodate that kind of erosion of personal identity. But we need a lot more thinking about that. Well, like a lot of people, um, my hope first is for a longer life because I've wanted to see everything about the future, uh, even if it's, you know, apocalyptic, you know, running man. <laughs> I'm ready for that. I've got my garden growing and, you know, I've, I've taken my pistol practice. I'm ready to, <laughs> I'm ready to fight off the zombies, but uh, I'm hoping for something better than that. Um, and I would like to see my own grandkids. I, my, my father died when my son, uh, my daughter was three and my son was one. And uh, my mother had died when I was a teenager. And so um, neither of them really got to experience my kids. And, um, and I'd certainly like to experience my grandkids. And I'd like to meet my great grandkids. And I think I would be one of those quirky great great grandparents that, you know, unlike the ones we were worrying about in here, who, you know, wouldn't understand any of the kids cultural references and would, you know, condemn them for their sexual practices. I think I'd be one of the quirky great-great-grandparents who'd be down with all the latest culture, you know. And so I'd, I'd really love to continue to, um, to engage with the future and see what it's like. I think the capacity for new forms of totalitarianism are uh, quite potent. Um, and the rationales for new forms of totalitarianism. And Julian Savalescu and Ingmar Persson have both <clears throat> argued for moral enhancement on the grounds that um, emerging technologies like nanoweapons or what are, plagues, or, uh, so the super weapons will make crazy individuals uh, super empowered to destroy the human race, and that that's a rationale for forcing every single human being to undergo moral enhancement. And um, that may seem like a completely crazy speculation today, but it might not in 50 years, you know. Well, I think you did a great job with this conference, man. I was very impressed um, having put them on, and um, so keep up the good work. Yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> Thank you very much for sure, that. Sure, my pleasure.